Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for episode 108. I believe it's episode 108. I got to get better at making sure before we start the broadcast. Today is Monday, October the 9th, year of our Lord, 2023. And we're going to get straight into the madness. Madness has broken out in the world. First off, I want to say my thoughts and prayers are with all the people there in Israel. All the people who are affected by this um, current war. This war has broke out between Hamas, the Palestinians, and, and Israel. Dangerous times, times that many people would look at and say are prophetic, biblical, biblical prophecy. Although this isn't the first time the Palestinians or, or, or the Israelis have been in open conflict there. And if they find a peace, which is still possible, this probably won't be the last time that those two com- countries are in conflict there. So it's always, always uh, reasonable to put things in perspective. I think the, the, the height, the heightened sense of, of chaos and um, corruption, sort of an evil spiritness, has everybody, or at least a good portion of people, looking back to biblical prophecy to try and make sense of, of what's going on in the world. And so obviously there are huge, huge prophecies and, and predictions and, and revelations in other parts of the Bible about conflict in Israel and, and what, it, what it means for the world, the rest of the world. So my thoughts and prayers are to everybody there, with everybody there in Israel. The great T.J. Klein, who plays with me uh, in the Big Three, is currently in Israel. He plays professional basketball there in Israel. And he says things are wild. They're wild. Um, So my thoughts and prayers are with the Lieberman family, specifically Nancy. I'm sure she's just, you know, worried sick. In fact, I need to call her again this morning and check on her and see how she's doing. Um, And and these are people who, who, um, let me me just speak about the Lieberman family for a moment. Uh, Nancy Lieberman, T.J. Klein, T.J.'s father, who went to Edina High School here in, in Minnesota in the greater Twin City area. These people are like-minded people. They believe in God. Um, they believe in having a country. And, and most importantly, they believe in, in having a, uh, an open mind, let's say, in these times to, to um, positions that are considered politically extreme. <laughs> right. Um, and I can't speak to their, their, their beliefs and I, I feel more comfortable allowing them to come on the show and speak to their beliefs. Maybe we'll, we'll facilitate that and maybe we'll have TJ Klein on to talk from there in Israel on, on the ground and, and tell us what it's like there, uh, being a professional basketball player or being a resident there in Israel. But, but certainly these are people who I know well, they're good people, um, and, and, uh, they're like-minded people. So, you know, it's a crazy time. Any, any time I see or hear about conflict in Israel, my first mind goes to the fact that I could easily be a person living in Israel as a professional basketball player. I've been offered to play in Israel a number of times um, and, and what that would be like. Uh, I have a number of friends who have played in Israel. For those of you who don't know, the Israeli Professional League is one of the best professional basketball leagues in the entire world. Uh, especially, I mean, in the in the in the international basketball community, uh, the Israeli league is is uh, amongst the best. You got Tel Aviv, who my good friend Trevor Mabakwe, my my fellow Minnesotan, Trevor Mabakwe played for for a number of years. You got Maccabi Haifa. You got you know you got a number of teams there that that are historic. Um, so that's always my first thought, and and then secondly, obviously I have a very very close personal. Uh, familial-like relationship with a number of, of, of Jewish people. Um, so I understand the, the, emotional, uh, the emotional toll that's taken place on people all around the world. And, you know, we, we, should, we should always be mindful 
of uh, the, the implications of, of such a conflict uh, on the soul, you know, on the soul, on the spirit of the people. And yet and still, we have to deal with the fact that there is a war that's broken out and, and what it means for everybody else, because there is implication for everybody else. And that's exactly what I want to talk about today. I'm going to get straight into it. Um, and hey, some people may not like what I have to say. Some people may find great disagreement. And anytime we talk about Israel or any time we talk about the conflict there between the Palestinians and Israel, we run the risk of, of not only uh, being politically incorrect, uh, but also uh, you know, greatly offending people on both sides of the aisle. I mean, it, it's such a loaded conversation, you can barely even talk about it at all without running the risk, a great risk of offending somebody or not being within the bounds of what somebody thinks is politically correct. And, and we, don't, we don't play that on this show. I mean, we're just going to talk about things the way they are. Now, number one, I'll say this. There are righteous and divine wars. There are holy wars. And, and um, throughout the Bible, for those who believe in the Bible, for those who believe in any metaphysical faith, especially of the Abrahamic variety, there are many times in the Bible where um, people who believed in God and were trying to follow the, the law or, or the, the direction of God um, were called to take up arms and, and fight a war. We get it. Sometimes war is necessary. Sometimes violence is necessary. We get it. And there are times, in my opinion, where violence may, in fact, be necessary. I mean, we sort of recognize that in our own American uh, common laws, um, ju judicial laws, when we, you know, see justifiable homicide, right? If you're backed into a corner uh, to a certain extent and you have no choice but to fight your way out, the law interprets that differently than if you, you know, wake up one morning and premeditatedly decide to go kill your girlfriend because, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. You think she's cheating. I don't know. Those are completely different things. So there are such things as justifiable use of violence, justifiable use of force. There are such things, and if you escalate that up the ladder, there are such things, obviously, as, as uh, justifiable means for war, uh, justifiable circumstance for war, and then and thus, at bottom, uh, justify, justified violence. If we don't live by any rules or any codes, then we're no better than the animals. There are some old codes, some old ways of life, some old, some old um, honor codes, right? beliefs of sacred honor that would do us justice today, especially as the world gets more chaotic and the, the potential for violence grows. If we don't live by some set of rules or codes, then we're no better than the animals. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal opinion on, on this, this, this conflict between Palestine and Israel throughout the entire podcast, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about its origins, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it grew, and I'm going to talk a little bit about where it is right now today and what it means going forward. But, but ultimately, those opinions aside, the first thing I'll say is anybody who claims to be righteous, anybody who claims to be fighting for um, their faith, their belief, or their ability to live in pursuit of God's love and God's grace, God's mercy, has to adhere to some type of law, some type of code, some type of sacred honor. If you don't, if, you do, if, if, your, if your righteousness is not so intact, um, that, that it could go before God, then you should be very slow to violence. And when you're not, when you let that sort of impulsive rage build up, even in a collective sense, and you get pulled into acts of, 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 of massive violence, like what we saw over the last couple of days, um, you run the risk of, of mortal sin. And so when I see women and children and elderly people being drugged um, out of their homes, into the streets, beaten, shot, 
probably raped, taken as hostage, taken for ransom. I see a circumstance where there's a crisis of sacred honor, where there's a, a rejection of righteousness and the pursuit of righteousness. Uh, God, as we said in the podcast last week, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Victory being one of them, victory in war even being one of them. Uh, there's nothing righteous about, about violence against innocent people, number one, and certainly violence against men, uh, from, from men uh, on women, children, and, and elderly people. There's nothing righteous about that. Don't give me some story about the history. I don't want to hear it. I don't need to hear it. I know the history well, very well, about as good as, as a person could know it. I mean, I, I can take you all the way back to the first Roman-Jewish war. Right. After, after Christ is killed and, and the Jews are still there occupying Israel and you have many Christians who get up and, and, and start to um, uh, travel throughout Asia Minor up into Europe and, and Peter finds himself in Rome and dies in Rome in, in 70 AD and, and about 40 years later, uh, or, or about, you know, somewhere between, you know, zero and 40 years later, you have a set of, of, of Jewish revolutionary wars against the Roman Empire and the taxes there. And the first Jewish-Roman war was effectively about taxes. But also you could look at the first Jewish-Roman war as the Roman Empire coming down on anybody who had a mon monotheistic faith, anybody who believed in a monotheistic God, which at the time most resembled Abraham. Whether you were Jewish or you believed in this, this lone renegade radical named Christ who we just okayed to be executed by you Jews themselves, all of you are in the same boat when it comes to the stability of the empire. All of you are in the same boat when it comes to the security of our dominion over the land and over the people. Now, the Jews revolted for a different reason. They didn't appreciate the tax. They didn't respect the tax. The first Roman Jewish war historically was seen to have, have taken place because the Jews, were, it was a tax revolt. Neither here nor there. The point is, well, and, and while we're on the history, let me just elaborate. The Jews lost the first Roman Jewish war, that Jewish revolution. And they were cast out into diaspora, and many of them started to travel east, and this is where they ended up in Babylon. Some of them traveled to Babylon, and this is where some of the first Talmuds were written in, in the Babylonian exile from, from Israel by the Romans. Now, Israel existed at the time. Judeo exists at the time. If you want this history, you can go back and look at the, the, the map the, the ancient map, the 2,000-year-old map that existed at the time. These are, these are real renditions of the maps that existed then. These aren't theoretical maps. These maps were on the, on the tables then in Rome because they had jurisdiction over these, these lands. And so Israel and Judea are already there on the map, and Israel, out of spite, is turned by the Romans, is renamed, Syria, Palestina. Again, Israel was there. It existed on the map. You can go read it. You can go look at it right now today. You can go pull up another browser, look up the map of Palestine and Israel or, or the, the Holy Land at that time, and you'll, you'll see what, you know, how it was laid out. Israel is turned into out of spite after the Jews revolted. They lose. They, they lose that war. About 200,000, they say, respectively, 200,000 Jews die in that, in that conflict. They get casted out. Some of them head to Babylon. Some of them spread up into that western, uh, southwestern Russia area, um, what, what they would now call the Khazars, Ukraine, right? I mean, this is all historically significant and relevant today in some ways. Um, but they get cast out and, and the Romans come in and they rename that entire area um, Syria, Palestina. Now, remember, at the, the, at the time where the Gaza Strip is, or in that area, you got the Philistines. The Philistines are, are, are to some, remembered as Palestinians. To others, this is disputed. Because when you change the name of a place, the people who live in that place start to identify as 
the name that you give them rather than their ethnicity. For example, a few episodes back, we talked about Osama bin Laden and how he was from Saudi Arabia, but he wasn't a Saudi ethnically. He was a Saudi national. He was Yemen. Yeah, he was from Yemen. He was a Yemen. Yem, uh, uh, I, I think it's a uh, Yemenian. Um, I don't want to say it was Yemenis because I don't think it's Yemenis. Regardless, he was from Yemen. His ethnicity was from Yemen. His nationality was from Saudi Arabia. Different thing. It all gets confusing, which is why a lot of this ethnicity and identity politics really starts to, to, to trample all over itself. And I don't think that's by accident. I think part of it is our own stupidity as the human race to categorize us in this way. But I also think that in that sort of chaotic, chaotic uh, separation of, of people, very opportunistic, manipulative powers that be find the, the source code to be able to keep us divided so they can conquer us, divide and conquer. Anyway, they renamed Israel, Syria, Palestina. Okay. That was the kickoff of of uh, of this whole conflict really about about that land right there i mean right there right you know a hundred years from when, within the time that christ died we have the 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 start of this war not to mention you know egypt you know the the, the conflict with the hebrews and, and egypt goes back two thousand years before that you know you got you got the the arabs who who came up I mean, the, the, this whole area is not a black and white situation. It's not a black and white situation. There are many tribes. There are many ethnicities. There are many nations. There are many powers outside of the, the scope of, of, uh, of the Middle East or Arab or Muslims or Jews that have interests in that area. This is a shit show. This is an absolute shit show in there. It's been that way for a long time. And there are no easy answers. There are no easy solutions. Anybody who tells you there are, they're lying to you. Now, there's one easy solution for us as American citizens. For us as American citizens, the answer is we cannot afford to go to war with Iran. Not because we're afraid of Iran, not because we condone what the, what the Persians are doing, or we condone Iran's potential involvement, probable involvement with this attack on Israel, not because of any of those reasons. We can't go to war with Iran because the stability of the United States of America represents the stability of freedom and democracy all around the world. And if America is too weak it's too weak to, to, to continue. It's too weak to, to defend our own home, our own homeland, our own country. How can, we, how can we dream of helping anybody else? I mean, these are basic, fundamental human perspectives and ways of life. You have to be healthy first. You have to have your home, own house in order before you can lend a hand to somebody else. If not, you have to be able to swim. You have to secure your life vest if the plane goes down in water. You have to secure your mask first before you secure somebody else's. Or, in effect, if you can't, both people die. Basic calculations you have to make in times of crisis that are not easy. And this is one of those moments. This is one of those moments in American history because all the rhetoric that's taking place, right? And we're going to go through it. We're going to go through the scenarios. We're not going to, you know, we're, we're not going to take a position or, or a theory, one theory, and say that's the theory. And then we're going to just go forward as though it's true. That's not the way to think. That's not the way American citizens should think. In times past, the military industrial complex and the mainstream media industrial complex. And hell, even the medical industrial complex, all these people want to give you one theory that's the accepted narrative. And they want you to treat it as fact. They don't want you to think about the multiple scenarios that could potentially be, you know, playing out. Simultaneously, sometimes all a couple scenarios playing out at once, but sometimes, you know, they want to give you one narrative when it's something completely different. They don't want you to think that there's any any chance on what the narrative is. Why? Because they need to be justified in moving forward and taking their next step, their next action. 
They can't do that with your consent if you're still up in the air, if you're still weighing the options, if you're still assessing the, 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 the field. And you should reject that. Every American citizen should be well informed about world politics, what's going on right now all over the world, and that should inform the way that you use your vote, the way that you use your dollar, and the way that you teach your children. And sometimes the best thing to teach your children is to wait, watch, and listen. Take in the information. Let's critically think about it. I'm going to help to do that on this podcast, and I'm going to try not to use profanity so you can watch the podcast with your children. If you have children and you want to watch the podcast and this seems like an important thing for you at this moment in time, feel free to let your children come into the room because I'm going to do my best not to swear in front of them. I can't make promises. Because after all, we are at war. But I'm going to try my best. So we're going to go through a few scenarios, but the, the first thing I want to say is America cannot afford to go to war with Iran. We can't afford to go to our war with Iran. We're already at war with Russia. We can't afford to go to war with Iran. If we go to war with Iran, Iran, uh, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine and Israel will be the first two of four dominoes in a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass that will break America once and for all. It'll break us. We cannot sensibly fight a war in the Ukraine, in Israel, in Kashmir, and in Taiwan. We can't do it. I mean, there's just no way we can do it. And if we concede to get involved here with Iran, then what happens when India goes to war with China or when China tries to take Taiwan? And I'm sorry, it's not really going to be when I say China and, and India because the, Pakist the Pakistanis do the bidding of the Chinese. So it's going to be Pakistan and India that go to war. And actually, that's the one tinderbox that's not being talked about right now. And I think everybody should have their eyes on the northern border of India and watch for a skirmish to, to break out there as well between Pakistan and India. And that one could go nuclear quick too because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. We, as American citizens, have to vote and spend our money in the interest of maintaining a strong and self-sufficient America. We have to do that so we could have any chance, any hope of helping any other nation. This was the fall of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire got so big, and they had so, min so much military, so many military forces out away from Rome, that finally, when the barbarians decided to sack Rome itself, there was nobody really there to defend it. There was nobody left to, to, to hold Rome. We have 2.5 million people crossing our border this year alone. We are being invaded. And I hate to use that military style, style you know, uh, rhetoric because I see it and hear it being used on Fox News, and I know they, they're not doing it in earnest for the most part, although true. You know, there are white lies and then there are black truths. White lies are, are little things you lie about that really uh, they don't have any consequence. We could argue and debate whether that's true because you could say that every white lie has a certain level of moral hazard. But then there are black truths. Truths that you tell that have a malicious intent. And you can, you can tell the truth, right? It's like I could know, I could know that my best friend is unstable, emotionally unstable, potentially violent. And I tell him in a state of rage that his wife is having an affair with the mailman. Now, I could argue that I'm doing that and I'm telling him just because I'm his friend and he has a right to know. But also, part of me may be jealous of that friend. I may be envious of that friend. Hey, maybe I want to crack at his wife. Maybe maybe I have a vendetta against the wife for some strange, odd reason. I wouldn't know what it is in this hypothetical situation, but it's possible. Maybe I'm having an affair with the wife, too, and I'm mad that she's stepping off with the mailman. I don't know. I don't know. But the point is, 
at that moment, I'm telling him because I want to motivate him to go do something violent. Maybe he and I have a business together, and if he goes to jail for murder or double homicide, then I get more, more, of, the, more of the pie. These, this, is, this is, I mean, I know it's hard for, for regular, everyday American citizens or people all around the world to think in these sort of, these sort of a wicked, malicious, you know, type of, type of terms. But trust me when I tell you, the malicious and the, you may not be interested in the malicious and, and wicked, but the malicious and wicked are certainly interested in you. And they will, they will stop at nothing to, to ma- manipulate uh, uh, and, and be wicked or malicious anywhere they need to be when the, when the emotion rises and they need it to be satisfied. That's what you have to understand. The people out there who really do think like that, they are very committed to their actions once they begin. So there are white lies and black truths, and I don't like when I hear Fox News call the border crisis an, inv- an invasion because I know the rhino, the rhino uh, 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 globalist sort of sentiment and spirit from the higher ups at Fox does not really care that we're being invaded, and I can say that with I can say that with with full uh, confidence. And then, hey, you can start to assess how much does how much do people care? That's a fair consideration. How much do you really care? Do you not care about the board? I mean, let's really start to think about it. What's the number one thing that could put a stop to the border crisis? That that could put a stop to immigrants flooding in the country the way they are? Policy, legislation, executive order. Those kind of things could put a stop to the to the invasion, couldn't they, Fox? Well, how do we deal with with policy? How do we deal with legislation? We do it through elections, don't we? Do we want to elect people that think that there's actually a problem with what's going on at the border? I would say so. If we want to elect people that would actually have the 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 the, the stones to do something about the border, don't you think it would be a, a, a matter of national security to put up a, a proper fight? A proper fight to find out the, 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 the information around the integrity of our elections and not punt at the first sign of pressure from the American court system and a company like Dominion? I mean, when you punt on a Dominion lawsuit and you give up the, 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 the small yet vital battle about election integrity, can you really claim to be worried about the invasion at the border? I'd say not. So Fox can go pound sand. When they talk invasion, I know they're just trying to fear monger, and they're trying to fear monger to a certain threshold in a certain way. They're trying to make fear mongering a jerk off activity. If you're going to have some fear there at home, have some rightful fear and get yourself ready, prepare. And you should all be prepared. And there's nothing wrong with being prepared. I mean, the whole Fox apparatus is this sort of, you know, be upset, be angry, but only be angry over tea and crumpets. Only be angry over, 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 you know, your chicken wing parties that your BPO use in the Republican Party. Only be angry in, uh, so much as to continue to watch the next segment of Fox so we can tell you how angry you should be. Where's the Fox, uh, where, where's the Fox News tutorial on, um, 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 food preparation or, or let's say, you know, basic, uh, basic, uh, survival skills, how to start a fire. If all your electricity and heat goes out, how to navigate, how to circumnavigate, uh, you know, by boat or, or how to circumnavigate, uh, you know, terrain with all the military experts who that with all the military experts they bring on Fox, why aren't they shoot if we're really in such dire straits and we're having illegal immigrants uh, invade our country and they could potentially topple the country entirely, why aren't we having tutorials and, and, and lessons on Fox News about how to navigate navigate, circumnavigate with a compass? Because they like you afraid, but they also like you weak vulnerable, unprepared. That aside, we are in in the middle of an invasion. And even if the people crossing our border isn't a coordinated invasion, 
of America, as we saw the barbarians do in Rome, we should treat it as such because we don't know. And nobody can honestly say that they know. We don't know. We don't know if all these people who are flooding into the, the country are a coordinated effort to, to, to weaken and, and, and make vulnerable um, uh, the American America as a nation, potentially the government, potentially law enforcement, potentially the military. We don't know. We just can't tell. So we hope for the best. We prepare for the worst. That's prudent. Back to the war at hand, the issue at hand. We cannot fight a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass while we currently have 2.5 million illegal immigrants coming through our border. It cannot be done. The only way it could be done, the only way it could be done, is if, if a polyglot of, of, of nations and, and, and international peacekeeping organizations or agencies from all over the world come together under one accord, under one single accord to, to identify and then annihilate a set of enemies. Hasn't that happened before? I mean, haven't we seen this game once before? Wasn't this World War I? Wasn't this World War II? And everybody's saying we're headed into World War III. World War III was already fought. We lost. The free people of America, the free people all over the world lost World War III. It already happened. World War III was about an 80-year silent war of misinformation and propaganda, brainwashing where we let the United Nations assume way too much power and authority over the affairs of the world, and we let certain countries, ourselves included, and primarily America, but also NATO, march around the planet and build up this animus and resent for the way that we use the United Nations Security Council, of which Russia sits on and now China sits on. Globalism happened during World War III, and it was a silent war of mis misinformation where they told you that was the best way to deter war. That the entanglement of international markets and, and, and supply chains and, and so on and so forth was the best way to ensure that we would not see another world war. They were wrong. They were wrong. The world war has, has begun. It's, it's on. It's on right now. I mean, the peace all across the world rests upon the edge of a blade. It hangs by a thread. And just so you guys know how I think, just so everybody out there understands where my mind goes, if the war machine is all the way turned on, which it seems it is, we're going to super fund the Ukraine until, until defeat, until we defeat the Russians. Now, potentially, we're going to fund Israel until we defeat Iran. If Taiwan goes, we will do everything to protect the sovereignty of Taiwan. We're going to fight China until defeat. If Pakistan attacked India, we would, we would, we would fight and, and protect India until Pakistan was defeated. If we're going to fight a forefront war, and the entire international banking cartel is going to back the West's play. And we're going to identify Pakistan, China, Iran, and Russia as the bet. North Korea as well. So, oh, that's another tinderbox. Watch for North Korea and South Korea. That's a tinderbox. And we'll talk about that one later because that one's a little different because we have 50, 50 to 75,000 troops on the ground there in South Korea. So it's a little bit different situation there. You can't fight a proxy war when all your soldiers are actually on the ground. We'll talk about that in a moment. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight and watching this broadcast. This is Professor Penn bringing you an advertising interlude. We're promoting MyBookie.com. MyBookie.com is part of the patriot economy, and nothing is more important than you 
supporting the patriot economy. That's those businesses and business people that are supporting the freedom movement. That's what we're doing here, spreading freedom from coast to coast and from north to south. Now, next time you go to a game or next time you watch a game, go to mybookie.com and use promo code Royce and lay down a bet. Bring a little more juice to the action. Bring a little more fun, a little spring in your step. Promo code Royce. That's mybookie.com, supporting the patriot economy, supporting all the people and all the businesses that are supporting this freedom movement. We love it. You'll love it. I love it. I've done it. I've had a great time doing it. This is Professor Penn coming to you once again for mybookie.com, promo code Royce. There'll be a little something special for you if you do it, and thank you very much. If we're going to fight a forefront war, and the price for goods, the price for missiles, the price for fuel, the price for uh, you know lug nuts and, and, and whatever else we need, uh, parachutes, boots, whatever it is, if the price is going to be set by the international banking cartel, and they're going to allow us to run up as much of a debt as we need to win this all-out war against the new access powers. If that's going to happen, the level of coordination, the level of preemptive reassurance that would be needed for us to say go on these war initiatives would have to be so great, so coordinated, so organized, so backed up by this mathematical sort of surety, there's no way that that alliance could not see 5,000 5, rockets being loaded up by Hamas in Palestine. You tell me, with any good sense, who would believe that the level of surveillance that exists currently around the world specifically in an area that is always the is always a threat or potential to be the catalyst for the next world war such as Palestine who is as as mainstream media would have us believe and and to a certain extent yes the puppet of Iran who would believe that there's not 24 hour 365 day surveillance on that area and if there isn't if there is not 24 set, I mean, this is kind of showing you, this is kind of showing you how deep the BS really goes. I mean, this is going to, this is pulling the cover off of how deep the BS is from the, for the whole story. If there isn't 24 7, 365 day surveillance, on Palestine and Hamas, an area that's completely closed in, if there's not 24-hour, 24 7, 365 day surveillance on that area, then we should repeal the Patriot Act tomorrow. The, the House Republicans, the House Republicans should put forward a motion right now today to repeal the Patriot Act because the violation of American citizens' privacy has also been found a failure in this deal. The coordination with the five eyes has been found a failure in this deal. All of these, all of these national security surveillance infringes upon American citizens' rights and privacies have been found a failure on this one day. Now, none of your Fox News pundits will tell you that. Nobody in the mainstream media is going to really talk about that because we all want the government to get a little bit bigger, a little bit bolder, a little bit, a little bit more spread thin. It benefits these people. I don't care what story they're telling you. It's time for you to think about your own citizenship. It's time for you to take back the narrative from the mainstream media, Fox included, and think about your own citizenship. What it means. What are the implications of these things we're getting ourselves into? The things we've allowed already. We got a Patriot Act that allows the, 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 the intelligence community, carte blanche, Maybe if you spent a little less time tracking Trump supporters, 
Maybe if you spent a little less time tracking MAGA nationalists, you'd have a little bit more resources to, to, to see 5,000 rockets being loaded up on Israel's border. But you want to use resources to track me. And then on the right day, you'll mistake me for a Muslim because I got a beard. Because I guess Muslims have a monopoly on beards. I mean, this is the level of either stupidity or malice that we're dealing with from the people who preside and govern over, go, govern over us. No, thou, no, no way. No way you can convince me that these people loaded up 5,000 rockets, took off and, 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 and para, parasailing, uh, 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 you know, makeshift uh, planes, basically. And nobody knew? And what, the cover story is because it was a Jewish holiday? It, 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 does MI6 recognize Jewish holidays? Does, does Interpol recognize Jewish holidays? Does the CIA recognize all Jewish holidays? Are, were all of you taking a break? Okay, maybe the Jews there in Israel were taking a day off, but isn't the whole alliance with Israel, between America and Israel, for us to be watching their back for them? Maybe you guys, maybe you guys were, you know, what, 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 what's, the, what's, what's the really going on here? I'm not here to speculate. I'm just asking the questions. What are the questions? That's the slogan for the last renaissance. I can't wait to get that podcast started with AJ. We may do the, 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 first, um, the, last, the first last renaissance podcast this week just so I can sit another person, another sane, logical person down next to me and have you hear how we talk and think about these issues. But the first place we start from are what are the questions? What questions should we be, we be asking? How was the entire surveillance world caught with their pants down? And if they were caught with their pants down, we as American citizens and free people all around the world should call into question the legitimacy and, and efficacy of the surveillance in the, in the first place. I mean, if you can't see one of the most terroristic parts of the world loading up 5,000 rockets. My, my, my faith in your, in your, in your competence to, to surveil anything with any real efficacy or, or, or uh, um, uh, justness, justice is low. It's at an all-time low. But that's not really the answer. The answer is they are, they are really good at surveillance. They're good at the things they want to surveil. And right now, I guess the, the, the protection and safety of Israel isn't high up on that list, eh? Or in some people's in some people's mind, in some people's mind, it is an advantage for the West right now. It is an advantage for the military industrial complex who oversees the surveillance. It is an advantage for the mainstream media industrial complex and all of its liberal overlords worldwide. To see Israel attacked by Hamas in this way. Anybody in the anti-war camp, anybody in the anti-war camp when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, who sees the, 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 the peculiar nature of that entire conflict, who questions the use of the resources, anybody who's straggling, we know how to get them on board for the, for the war effort and the war machine. We know what hard strings to pull. All roads lead back to Israel. Good. The, the, sine, the sine qua non of the entire global military industrial complex storyline. It's all to protect Israel. It, I mean, the whole thing is, if, if, we, if we concede Taiwan, if we concede the Ukraine, if we concede South Korea, the further and further we drop back, eventually we have to cede Israel, and we all know that's not an option. And I wrote in my letter to LeBron James, my open letter to LeBron James. You can go get it right now on Amazon. Epistle to the King. I talked about this. I said when the, when the, when the hordes rise up against Israel, that the Europeans 
that the European Finocchios will leave Israel to the horde the same way the Romans left Great Britain to the Saxons. Here we are. Here we are. These are Europe's people in Israel, many of them. These are, I mean, you, you, start to, you start to ask yourself these questions, right? Why hasn't Europe, why hasn't Europe mobilized a response for Israel? These are your people. These Jews came from Poland. They came from, from uh, you know, Germany. They came from Central Europe, a lot of them. Why haven't they mobilized a, 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 a response? An immediate response. Well, they got their own problem. Well, oh, France still having a problem with, with the Muslims there in, in, in France. They're having a problem all throughout Europe. And you, gotta, you just start to ask yourself, are these people completely and utterly stupid? Or are they wickedly brilliant? Some people, some people believe that this was that, that, that somebody somewhere let this happen. And everybody's comparing it to 9-11. This is Israel's 9-11. Well, it just so happens that many believe somebody somewhere knew that 9-11 was going to happen. And that they let that happen. History repeats itself. I mean, it's strange, isn't it? I'm not making definitive statements. I'm certainly not excusing what Hamas did. What I'm asking people to do is ask the right questions. And then we can probably get down to the bottom of who's responsible here. If we even want to theorize about who's responsible here. But the first thing we have to do is have our own house in order. And by having our house in order as American citizens, we need to understand there is no way possible we could fight a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass without conceding all of our remaining rights and citizenship to a full-blown global police state. It cannot be done. It cannot be done. Everybody keeps saying Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel has the right to defend. Absolutely they do. And I would hope for my great friend T.J. Klein's sake, they will. And I will hope that their response should be harsh. Absolutely. Wars happen. People go to war, people die. Sometimes it's necessary. It's not necessary to save the planet. It's not necessary because, because we're killing too many cows and there's too much methane from cow farts and we can't, we can't continue to, to, to take from the planet. It's not necessary because some strange, you know, uh, story from the, from, the, from the guide stones or, you know, we need a population of 500 million, so let's, let's kill off people, you know, just on a whim. On an, on, an, on, an, on an ideological whim. But there are needs for violence and there is need for war at times. And people die. So yes, Israel should be able to defend itself. And here's another co cover story. If over the last 60 years, Israel has not accumulated the ability to defend itself, if it has not used the, 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 the cover and security of the full force of our American military to prepare itself, to defend itself, and be successful in defending itself, then our aid for Israel has been a scam. The entire time, our aid for Israel has been smoke and mirrors.
If over 60 years, our brothers and sisters there in Israel have an Israeli government that has not used the cover of the American military to prepare itself to defend itself against Hamas, and even if so, Iran, then our aid and support there has been a scam, has been a cover story. Yes, Israel should be able to defend itself. Why are we sailing the Gerald Ford up into the Mediterranean? What is going on here? I mean, what is really going on? Are we going to go to war with Iran for Israel? Because there is no land war between Israel and, and Iran because Israel's not that type of country. It's going to be an air war. They'd have to cross Iraq to get to Iran. Guys, we can't do it. I'm telling you now, mark my words, mark it on this day. We cannot fight a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass without giving up the rest, the remaining, our remaining rights and citizenship to a full blown totalitarian global police state. It cannot be done. And we're not going to feel it here first. They're going to feel it there. They're going to feel it in Jordan, in Yemen, in Iraq, in the, the entire area. They're going to feel it first. All I'm saying is the Israelis have the capacity to fight their own, their own war. And if they don't have the capacity to fight their own, own war, as Americans, we are in such a dire situation globally. We are in such a dire situation financially. We are in such a dire situation domestically that it may, in fact, be time to evacuate Israel. Who's going to say that? Who's going to tell you that? Make people show their cards. Now we got to make people throw down. It's time to call some people's bluff. Sometimes when you call some people's bluff, you get a better read of what everybody has. Where do the Europeans really fall on the deal? Where do, uh, you know, where do the Turks fall on the deal? Erdogan, where does Erdogan fall on the deal? He don't got no love for Israel. I mean, where, you know, let, let, let's, let's, where does Egypt fall on the deal? Who are their allegiances really to? If we can't properly defend Israel in an all-out forefront war on the Eurasian landmass, contingencies need to start to be put in place and evacuation plans need to start to be put in place. Now, many people there, many of the Jews, many people in Israel will say, hey, we're not leaving our land. This is the holy land. We're not leaving it. We're going to defend it. We'll die for it. And that's honorable. It's honorable to fight and die for your home, for, for your home or for, 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 you know, I mean, let's go back to the basics game, game, you know, the, 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 the game of war itself. If I come up to an open land and there's another person there and they don't want to share the land and it's contested. It's a fight to the death. Whoever's left standing, they get that land. I thought we were beyond that. This entire post-World War II democratic liberal order was supposed to be the, 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 the realization of a civility, of a civilized uh, uh, society, global society that didn't think that way. But that was a cover story. That was a cover story. We just found a higher intellectual, a, a higher and more sophisticated way to play the same war game that we've always played. More asymmetrical war, but in sometimes all out piracy. Still, we just selected a group of people who got to pick where the piracy was going to be legal and where it was going to be called piracy. That's not righteous. That's not honorable. 
that's not sustainable. You you weird Finocchio yuppie posh liberals want to talk about sustainability and your little corporate your little you know corporate think tank uh, uh you know Judeo Buddhist uh prayer uh, studies circle jerks you want to talk about su- su- sustainability there's nothing sustainable about that model of governance of global governance we'll select a few con- a few countries they get to oversee when it's deemed piracy and when it's deemed legal piracy, all that builds up is moral hazard. And that's what we're dealing with now. The Jews may need to find may may need a place to fall back to if stuff really hits the fan right there in Israel. We'll take them here in America. I mean, let's think about it. We're letting 2.5 million Anybody's from anywhere cross the border. If we're going to let 2.5 million anybody's from anywhere come into the country, undocumented, illegally, why wouldn't it be a fallback, uh, a fall, uh, uh, why wouldn't it be a rally point for the Jews? The Holy Land's not going anywhere. The Holy Land's not going anywhere. It's holy. The whole identity of the land itself is metaphysical. The Holy Land can be taken back at a later date. The Holy Land can be recaptured at a later date. The Holy Land can be fought for at a later date. When we can actually sustain a military campaign that has some chance of success without conceding all of our rights and freedoms, the remaining rights and freedoms we have, to an all-out totalitarian global police state. Who's going to talk like that? Who do you hear talking like that? Evacuate Israel. Let's see where Americans really stand. Oh, here's an idea. Why aren't the Europeans offering refuge, an open refuge to the Israelis, to the Jews? A lot of them come from there in the first place. And and I get it. I get it to even suggest this would, would offend some Jews there in Israel. But I mean, the offer is, 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 I mean, the gesture alone isn't, isn't, you know, isn't good. It's wrong to offer somebody your home, to offer somebody refuge in, in case of emergency. Maybe those contingencies are already in place, but why are they never spoken about? Well, why does why why has the entire global military narrative been built on this idea that Israel is the last stop, that the buck stops with Israel? Why is the entire global media narrative built around this idea that the last campaign will take place in Israel? Why? Did does somebody know something we don't know? Now, let's go at it from the other end. Let's go at it from the other angle. There's something that exists called the Iron Triangle. It's an alliance, an alliance that's somewhat secret, but in effect, not so secret, between Iran, China, and Russia. And they call it the Iron Triangle because supposedly it could never be broken. The Iron Triangle is effectively what McKinder, Halford John McKinder, the McKinder Land Theory, the McKinder World Island Theory, and, and his, his opinion, not a fact, his opinion in the early 1900s that the, the nation or the person, people, who controlled the heartland, controlled the Eurasian landmass and effectively the Eurasian World Island. Why? Because as means of transportation, as means of transportation evolved, naval superiority would be challenged. And and we've seen that part come true. Because they can sail 
the the Ford, the Gerald Ford into the Mediterranean all they want to. When it really goes down, like Chris Martinson told us early, early on in the podcast, and we may need to have him on, with the level of technology that we have now, boats are just big, uh, uh, you know, big pieces of metal out there in the in the sea waiting to get sunk. That's the reality. Now, I'm not saying there are no, uh, you know, evasive maneuvers and things that that these ships can do to cloak themselves and things like that. But ultimately, ultimately, ships are on their way out. And certainly it's slower to sail somewhere than it is to go by train. It, where you can walk, you have a much more sufficient supply chain for military resources. It's the reality. This is why Adolf Hitler lost World War II, because his greatest adversary was too far for him to sail to before in time. It's just the reality. It's harder to sail than it is to walk or drive or train, certainly than to, to, to fly. Now, many people believe that we have that that the Americans have air superiority because we have naval superiority, that naval superiority lends itself to air superiority because you need to be able to move ships and ships that carry planes that can take off at sea. So there's a there's an element of that. And OK, some of that is true. But now you got to get fuel to your battle. I'm not going to lay out a battle plan to defeat the West. That's not my point here. The point is the iron triangle between Russia, China, and, and Iran is a somewhat secret alliance that is very, very threatening to stability in the West. Some would say it's conceivable that China greenlit Iran to greenlight Hamas, to attack Israel in order to, to deter this new alliance that was announced recently where they wanted to build a counter Belt and Road Initiative called Rail and Port that would connect India, the Saudis, uh, the Israelis, and Americans to the European Union. Some would say, now, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, the Iranians may be behind Hamas's attack. In fact, it would seem most likely that the Iranians are because Hamas doesn't take a piss without Iran knowing about it. Well, Iran doesn't take a piss without China knowing about it because that's half of their economy. Half of Iran's economy is selling oil to the Chinese. They don't take a piss without China knowing about it. And you can't convince me that China doesn't know about it. You can't convince me that China has the level of surveillance they do on their own people and not be watching their next door neighbor there in Iran. Can't convince me. I'm not going for it. Especially when they're, you know, they're the boss over there, right? They're the customer, the ultimate customer. I'm not saying Iran doesn't have its own culture and its own way of thinking. But this is pretty Darwinian at that global level. Right. And people act without, without the permission of others sometimes, but it all falls back up a, up a pyramid. And the thing, you know, with, with, as a side note, the thing you got to realize and understand about the Iranians and the Turks, these people still have that complex, that, that, sort, of, that sort of empire complex that they're their own people. They think of themselves as their own people. They don't think of themselves as Muslims. They don't think of themselves as, as, as nationalities. They think of themselves as the, rem the remnants of an empire. They have, that sense of, they have that sense of history. They have that sense of cultural identity. The Persian Empire, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, these people, and they, they play that way. The Persians play that way, and so do the Turks. Some people would say, that this is a, a way to slow down the rail and port initiative that would ultimately combat Belt and Road on the Eurasian landmass in a U.S., India, Israel, Saudi alliance. Hard to see how an attack on Israel would, would slow that down. It would seem that with that alliance, 
an attack on Israel only unifies and expedites the building of a rail and port initiative there on the Eurasian landmass. We don't know. We don't know. If the BRICS has now inducted Iran and Saudi Arabia and, and brokered this deal, this peace deal, if China's brokered this peace deal with the Saudis, somebody here is playing both sides of the fence. Somebody here is playing both sides of the coin. And I haven't quite yet put my finger on it, but it's very clear that there is a, a, a four player jump ball between Europe, the Americans, China, and Russia, and that everybody else in between there has a, has a choice to make. There's a fence that they're riding, and Israel's one of them. Israel's one of them. They're their own people. They, like the Persians and like the Turks, view themselves as their own people and their own nation. And there's nothing wrong with that. They should. In fact, Part of the anti, part of the, part of the criticism of Israel that comes from the American left, Jewish community, in fact, people who are mostly Democrat, that don't like Bibi Netanyahu is because he is a nationalist. Now he's a spooky dude, no doubt. You can't trust him. He's a, he's a spook. He's a spy. He's exactly what Putin was in Russia in Israel, former military, former spy, former special operations, straight up killer, assassin. So you can't trust anything he says. His secrets have secrets. Okay. But the point is, Israel views them. He is a nationalist. He is adamantly, adamantly, uh, um, um, he is adamant about the security of Israel's nation. Just so happens, they're in an almost indefensible position. Or I guess we're going to see now, aren't we? I guess we're going to see. And part of, the, part, of the, part of the problem with geopolitics, part of the problem with international war games is nobody knows what everybody else really has until the, sh until the, the spit goes down. Nobody knows what ever, anybody else has until the game is on, so to speak. I can watch you warm up. But I don't really know until we we go to jump ball and and that ball's up in the air and I'm right up close to you and I can and you know the 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 sizing up isn't isn't at a distance. Everybody looks a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit faster and stronger at a distance. Sometimes when you get up close, that person's stronger, bigger, faster than you thought. Sometimes they're not. Nobody knows what anybody else has. Somebody's playing both sides of the fence here. Somebody's playing both sides of the fence. What I hope isn't the case, what I pray isn't the case, is that the Americans, that we and, and our intelligence community would allow this attack to take place as a means to get more people in the world and here in America on board with the military-industrial complex war machine. I pray that's not the case. I really do. Free People Radio thanks you for watching and listening tonight, and this is Professor Penn here for GhostBed. That's ghostbed.com. So let me tell you why I love this product. Professor Penn has problems sleeping. That's right. I have problems sleeping, and you might too. So there is nothing more important than getting a mattress, a mattress that helps me sleep. That's why I love ghostbed.com. Go there, go to ghostbed.com, upward slash Royce, and use promo code Royce for 50% off on the whole catalog. And when I say the whole catalog, they got a lot more than mattresses. They got sheets, they got pillows. And what makes it super cool for me personally is they got super cooling technology that helps you get through the night without sweating. That's right. There's nothing worse than waking up in a pool of my own sweat. That's why I love Ghostbed. Their products help me sleep through the night cool and safe and calm. So go to ghostbed.com, upward slash Royce, promo code Royce, or 40% off site-wide. And thank you very much for watching. Everybody wants to make this about Palestine and Israel and who's right and who's wrong. I mean, there's so much more going on here. 
And we all know it. And for all of us out there who accept that it's just about Palestine and Israel, we're playing right into their hands. We're playing right into their hands. I pray that we didn't allow this attack to happen as a justification to go to war with Iran. I pray that that's not the case. If you want to go to war with Iran, come before the American people and tell us why. Tell us why. Maybe you got a good enough reason. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not here caping up for the Iranians. I'm not saying that the Iranians aren't capable of, of major uh, uh, harm and damage and violence. But this whole, this whole culture of secrecy, this whole culture of military secrecy is out of control. Whatever those threats are out there in the world, we can't know about them because it would preemptively let our enemies know that we're coming. I mean, this is not a way, this is not, this is not a way to do safety, security, military effectively and maintain American citizenship the way that our founding fathers saw fit. Which is why my answer is simple today. With all the thoughts and prayers and heartache I feel for the people in Israel, for all the heartache I feel for the people all in the, in the, in the immediate region and the violence that's going to break out in, in the weeks, in the days and weeks and months to come. Needless violence. These attacks were needless violence. With all of that said, America cannot afford to fight a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass without surrendering our remaining rights and privacy to an all-out global totalitarian police state. It cannot be done. We have to know our limits. It cannot be done. And for all of you sitting at home who, 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 you know, who think it can be done, get ready to have your children drafted. Get ready to have your children, your, your, your sons and daughters drafted into the military. And even then it might not be able to be done. I mean, we couldn't win a war in Afghanistan. We couldn't win a war in Iraq. Yeah, we toppled the Iraqi government that we put in place in the first in, 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 to begin with. That we put in power in the first place is what I was going to say. Yeah, we toppled an Iraqi government because we knew everywhere we knew exactly where to go. We put them there. We knew every we knew every nook and cranny of that Iraqi of the Saddam regime. We knew everywhere we needed to go. It was just a it was just a manhunt, basically. It was like a local manhunt. When Saddam, when Saddam, when Iraq government fell and Saddam went on the run. It was just a little local manhunt. We knew exactly where they were. We knew exactly where to go. We knew exactly where to look. Didn't take us long at all. Sure, he was on the run for, for a minute. We found him. We let them hang him, kill him. Okay. He was our guy to begin with. Got a little big for his britches. Thought he could do thought he could do business with the big boys. Got a reality check. The biggest reality check you could get. Point is, we didn't win that war. We created a vacuum. We created a vacuum of terrorism. ISIS now is whatever many iterations of, of ISIS that it is now. I don't know. There's all kinds of new names for it. I mean, it's it's just, you know, it's blossomed into, into a never-ending justification for military involvement in Iraq. Same with Afghanistan. We leave $90 billion of equipment there in Afghanistan. The Taliban's offering to bring equipment to Hamas for the attack. Openly.
$80 billion worth of equipment. $80 billion worth of equipment. Now there are reports that the, the, the weapons and the munitions that we're sending to Ukraine could potentially uh, are, are not secure. In fact, I think it was a Department of Defense. It was a Department of Defense uh, report that said that the, the, the movement uh, of munitions that we're giving to Ukraine aren't secure and could make their way onto black markets that could then in turn be used in an, an attack just like this. Right now, the Israeli government needs to be doing uh, uh, forensic accounting, needs to be doing forensic investigation on the remnants of, of any shells and things that are found there in Israel. If any of those munitions came from the Ukraine, there needs to be a full-blown pause, stop, diplomacy, peace talk, because the American government has once again bit off more than it could chew. If one shell, if one bullet, if, if, if one rocket that was, that was used there in Israel ends up being from our aid to Ukraine, somebody's ignorant or somebody's in on it. And I tend to think somebody's in on it. But I'm open to believing somebody's ignorant in good faith. And my, all my good faith is just about run out. I'm telling you that now. All my good faith is just about run dry. I'm starting to think more and more that people are in on it. Because I'm not one of these people who believe that most of these individuals, most of these organizations are too ignorant to be this coordinated. I know how easy it is to coordinate people outside the scope of your average everyday citizen. Because your average everyday citizen is so brain dead, so brainwashed, so caught up in the mundane, so caught up in the everyday hustle and bustle. They have no real, no real understanding of, of, of any basic community organization. Why do you think they call it the intelligent? Our, our lack of coordination our lack of, 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 of uh, collaboration in your everyday American citizens' community is such that it's hard to even call it a community. It's just a bunch of people who live in the same place that drive by and interact with each other on a daily basis. That's not a community. A community has to share values. They have to share something more than the place that they live or the color of their skin or the sound of their pronouns. That doesn't make you a community. The CIA, that's a community. The NSA, that's a community. The FBI, that's a community. The D.C. swamp, that's a community. That's why they call it the intelligence community. But they're much more resembling a real community than the black community. There ain't no black community in comparison to these people. And they show us it. They brag about it. My point is they have the ability to be coordinated. They have the ability to be coordinated at a level that we, we have trouble comprehending. This was the Bay of Pigs, you know. This, this was the Bay of Pigs. This was Iran-Contra. Okay, we could say Reagan didn't know. There were rogue groups. The point is, you better be slow to fight. You better be slow to violence. If you can't see, if you can't see the blind spots, too many blind spots is a red flag to go forward with military action and violence. And all of them want to tell you how educated they are. All of them want to tell you that they went to West Point or some other prestigious political science or military institution. They know best. They know best. They know best. And I'm not condemning or, or, or you know, uh, berating or, or trying to 
uh, you know, insult those institutions. I'm sure there are great people who come from within those institutions. But en masse, institutions and credentials themselves all across the American culture have become the means and justification for people to be either radically ignorant and incompetent or in on a scam, which we all accept because how credentialed people are. I see it all the time. Well, this person said, well, that person said, look at the results. How smart are these people? We can't even keep eyes on Hamas. You just launch 5,000, just wake up one morning and launch 5,000 rockets into Israel and nobody knows nothing, nobody's the wiser. And they're so insulting, they go on the, 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 the mainstream news and tell you uh, everybody was caught off guard because Israel's on holiday. Okay, Israel can be on holiday, the Jews can be on holiday. What's that got to do with the rest of you, Finocchios? Didn't Yom Kippur start on a holiday? The Yom Kippur War? The last time the Jews had to fight a three-front war right there in their own neighborhood, didn't that happen on a holiday? So shouldn't every Jewish holiday be on high alert, high security alert for the rest of the intelligence community? How do you get caught with your pants down on a Jewish holiday? How is it that one of, uh, uh, how is it that Israel's main opponent in the region could load up and launch missiles on a holiday? The holiday should be the highest security alert there is. Given the history, the unique history. We just had Yom Kippur. The whole month should be a high security alert. Something's going on here. I don't know what it is. We should continue to ask questions. We should continue to watch and listen. We should watch how our political leaders handle themselves. We should take an accounting. But the American citizen should get ready to vote its position that we cannot fight a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass while we have 2.5 million people coming across our border undocumented, illegally. We cannot fight a forefront war on the Eurasian landmass at all potentially, without surrendering all of our remaining rights, freedoms to a global totalitarian police state. And it's not beyond me that the push for war, the push for chaos and violence comes from a group so coordinated that they have, they have the ear behind every enemy line in every direction and the real, the real goal is to plunge us into complete chaos so that people beg for tyranny. Give me more viruses. Give me plague. Beg for vaccines. Give me more poverty. Give me more in inflation. Beg for universal basic income. Give me war. Beg for martial law. This is not about the Jewish people. It's not about Jews. This isn't, this isn't anti-Semitic. This is about the American people. And the American people have the right to look out for their best interests. We've supported Israel for so long. They should, be, they should be stacked to the gills with weapons and let them do with them what they will and let them answer for the choices they make. Make your decision, live with your decision. We should not have to be roped into their decision to defend themselves. Honest to God. And my good friend is there right now and I love him to death and I hope that Israel does everything it can to send a clear message that it can't be bullied. And I hope my good friend TJ gets on a plane as fast as he can and comes back to the United States because playing basketball isn't worth being in the middle of somebody else's war.
And that would be my call to all my Jewish brothers and sisters. God is in here. Your commitment to God is in here and in here. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace is everywhere. It's not in a place. It's not at a given time. It's everywhere. It can be accessed from anywhere. New Jerusalem. And what's so funny about that is that this is how loaded, this is how loaded the cultural narrative has become. This is how brainwashed we've become. This is how, this is how chaotic they've made people's um this is how chaotic they've made people's minds when talking about these geopolitical issues. I'll say that we should be a refuge for the Jews, and there'll be people in my own community, on my own side of the aisle, who say, you're trying to, you know, you, um, you're shilling for the Jews, for Israel. There'll be people who say, why are you willing to let Israeli refugees come to America, but not refugees from South America or anywhere else in the world? And the answer is very simple. We have a geopolitical militaristic position with Israel, one that certain individuals are committed to defending at all costs. So the implications and ramifications of Israel are significantly different than Venezuela. And if you don't understand that, you're a child. If you don't understand that, you're a, a small, drooling, dribbling, uh, weak-armed infant. Bobblehead infant. If you don't understand, there's a significant difference between the impl there's a significant difference between what is at stake with Israel as a geopolitical issue and what is at, is at stake with Guatemala. Guatemala is already under our jurisdiction, our protection. And in fact, it's the same military industrial complex that wants you to believe that all of these immigrants are coming through the border of their own free will, organically, because of despot governments all, all over the, the Western Hemisphere. That despotism, is what's driving despotism and fascism and all of these other, is what drives uh, these, these refugee migrations. They won't say that it's socialism. They won't say that in some of these governments are communists. They make sure never to say that because they think you're stupid. Greater implication with Israel than Guatemala. And in fact, what's, what's even more interesting about it is that it just so happens that Israel is a government of the variety where the documentation on each citizen is so great that the migration and the rally for the Jewish people to be in America would have them all be documented. That's the difference. The difference is any refugee program for the Jews to move back to America to come to America while we sort our stuff out, while we get our house in order, they come with full documentation. Tough. Hey, you come from a refugee country where you don't have any documentation or you're, uh, it's not my deal. It's not my deal. We're not in charge of the entire world. We're not, we're not, in, I mean, what, what, just, I mean, just on face value. How many people, how many strangers, complete strangers, are you going to let come move in your house or in your backyard? And that's the thing about some of you Finocchio liberals that want to preach this humanitarian crisis like uh, uh, Ayanna Presley. We're faced with a humanitarian crisis. We need to find a way to let these people come live here. Knowing full well there's no real plan to have these people come live here. She's using them the same way many people have used the Jews to push greater, more corrupt political agendas. It's 
It's not a humanitarian crisis. We're we're not the we're not the police of the entire world. We're not in charge of everybody's everybody's problems. Just like my house isn't my my house my my home is not a is not is not a open uh, an open door for every single homeless person that's having a tough time in life. And I wouldn't expect to go to anybody else's uh, to just anybody's house if I was having a tough time and, and became homeless. Homeless, scared, afraid, abused, refugee, it, it doesn't matter. Now, what I'm saying about Israel is America has invested so much money, so much time, and so much resource into Israel, we are committed. It's called pot committed. We're pot committed in Israel. And we're pot committed to the Jewish people. On behalf of the Europeans, we'll take another IOU, Europe. You, 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 Finocchios in Europe, we'll take another IOU while you run your egalitarian Scandinavian think tanks. We'll take another IOU, Davos. And we're watching you because it's not so clear that you're not behind some of this stuff, too. We're watching all of you. This is the type of American leadership they don't want to, to come to sit in the Senate. This is why the Democrat Party will do everything in their power to call their buddies in the Republican Party and make sure that I don't get the type of support in my run for the United States Senate. This type of leadership right here. We're watching all of you. All the deals are suspended. All the deals are suspended until further notice. Somebody asked me the other day when the speakership was up, somebody goes, you'd make a great speaker. Royce for speaker or Royce for press secretary. I don't want to be press secretary. I don't want to be Speaker of the House. I don't even have ambitions really to be president. I want to be the director of national intelligence. President Trump, when you win in 2024, make me the director of national intelligence. I guarantee you in 60 days, we'll have every single agency whipped up into shape. Director of national intelligence. Let me sit, sit across from the Chinese intelligence. Make them fly here. All of you come to us. You come fly to us. We're not coming to you. We don't need to come to you. You come here. See, we got this whole thing backwards. We've been playing from the down position. There's no reason for the Americans to play, play from the down position other than self-doubt, self-loathing, and self-masochism. We don't need to play from the down position. We're in the up position. We have the people, we have the economy, we have the ingenuity, and most importantly, we got the bullets. We have the farmland. Our founding fathers gave us a blueprint. We need to get back to that blueprint. That's what make America great uh, again is. We solved the race issue. We abolished slavery. Let's stop talking about America in totologies as though we're either a nation that lets everybody come to America or we're a slave uh, country, a racist slave country. Don't insult my intelligence like that, Ayanna Presley. Don't insult my intelligence. You better go borrow one of those wigs from your buddy Joanne Reed before you think you can insult black men's intelligence like that. When you went and learned that Marxist foreign policy, that Marxist geopolitical foreign policy from white liberals at university, you better go borrow Joy Ann Reed's white woman's wig and put it on if you think you're going to perpetrate that type of clown show in front of serious people. The Make America Great Again we need to get back to is the intellectual idea that a nation of shopkeepers fortified by the Second Amendment is a safeguard to international imperialism. Economic, international, economic imperialism. We're not going to become a tributary state to the CCP. We're not going to become a tributary state to the party of Davos or the European Union. We're not going to become a tributary state to the Russian Empire. We're not going to become a tributary state to Israel. We are not anybody's tributary state. If there's a war, there's a war. Wars happen. Fight your war. Fight your war. We will offer refuge 
to the Jews and the Israeli people because we're pot committed. And if adults don't understand or can't can't reconcile the idea of being pot committed, then you're then you don't you can't be in the casino. You can't play the game. You you can't play. Your chips are revoked. You're out. 86. You can't be here because you don't understand what we're dealing with. We're pot committed in Israel. We're not pot committed in Peru. We don't have no allegiance or no no implications of the Peruvian government being mad because we won't take their refugees. We're talking about nuclear Israel here, guys. Pay attention. Wake up. Stop listening to Ayanna Presley. Wake up. And maybe it's not today, and maybe it's not tomorrow, and maybe it's not yet next year. But when World War breaks out, the Jewish people there in Israel are going to have to get very serious about what their contingency plans are in the event that we cannot protect that outpost because we've seen it happen before with the Roman Empire. And I would hate, I would hate for the tragic day to come when the Israeli people, when the Jews have not considered that contingency, that very real contingency, and made the proper plans to save the people there in Israel. And I hope, I hope and I pray that the murmurs and the rhetoric that you're going to completely defeat Hamas is not going to be the justification for an all-out genocide of two million Palestinians. I pray, I pray that we're not going to go there. I mean, if we want to just have unconstrained amounts of, of moral hazard, let's just fire the nukes, guys. I mean, let's just get after it. Let's go to all-out nuclear war, nuclear apocalypse, and let's see who survives. If we want to just play, play, who can, who can, you know, who can get the more, most moral hazard dice? Let's just go all the way. And you know what's scary about it? it seems like that's what some of you really want to do. That's where we're headed. We're sailing the Gerald Ford into the Mediterranean for what? You guys are going to play air. You going to play airstrike with Iran? And you know what's the most scary? And Jason Whitlock and I talked about this yesterday. What's most scary is some of you are still watching. Some of you are still watching professional sports. I mean, I love a good basketball game as much as the next person. I went this morning to the gym myself and and taught the young men, uh, uh, trained with the young men, uh, uh, you know, in basketball. And part of it's about their success as basketball players, but part of it's about teaching life skills. And sports teaches life skills. And professional sports can be a tool for life skills. And I'm not saying you should all go cower in your, in your basement and, and um, you know, wait for the, 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 the doom and gloom to be a reality. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying at least, can we find a good chunk of time in the day to listen to people who are not paid by the mainstream media industrial complex to tell us our information and news about being citizens. I don't, you, you can go to casinos, you can, uh, uh, you can play sports, you can watch football, you can bet on football, you can do whatever you want to do. I mean, I'm not, I, look, you're a citizen. I, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to judge. Dress up like, you, you're a man, 40-year-old man, dress up like a woman. Fine. I mean, I don't agree with it. I think it's weird. But you're a citizen. You can do what you want. Short of raping, killing, stealing, and, and, and sexually abusing children, have at it. Okay? You're a citizen. Our rights grant you that, that, grant you that much. Would I recommend it? No. What I will recommend is this. No matter what it is that you're doing that's debauched and depraved, can you at least find a little bit of time in the day to be informed by some people who are not paid by the exact same institutions that spent 60 years in World War III, a silent information war, to brainwash you and, and mislead you and manipulate you into the World War III they're going to stage. And it will be staged. And it will be, an opportun- it will be a crisis filled with opportunity. And they will capitalize on the opportunity. If you don't find the time to become informed. I'm not saying you have to listen to me. 
find somebody. Please find somebody other than CNN or Fox News to tell you about what's breaking off, breaking out there in Israel. Please, for the love of God. If you listen to Sean Hannity, if you listen to Sean Hannity or, or uh, 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 you know, I don't even know who's left over there at CNN. Cuomo got clipped. Don Lemon got clipped. Who's at CNN? I don't watch it anymore. I don't know who's over there. I don't know. I don't know who's over there. I can't even pick a name out. I really don't know. Whoever's over there, MSNBC, Joy Reid, Morning Joe, Cuck Joe, and, and Morning Mika. Please find somebody else to listen to. That's all I ask you. And I ask you to keep an open mind because when you enter into the fog of war, you're in the law of uncertain outcomes. This has been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio, powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us, help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in that freedom of movement, and it's exactly what they want to take from you now. Go to freepeopleradio.com. Today, our, pl- our patron platform is up. It is available. There are many ways for you to donate and contribute to the podcast. Not all of them are working optimally, but I'm sure if you go there, you can find a, a way to contribute to the podcast. Our store will be up. Spit on the Floor t-shirts coming in the next seven days. Um, don't die a jerk-off t-shirts. Don't die a jerk-off um, hoodies. Spit on the Floor hoodies. Sweatshirts, Cuck Slayer, T-shirts, Cuck Slayer, hats, Cuck Slayer coffee mug, Free People Radio merchandise, all coming in the next several days. So make sure you stay tuned on freepeopleradio.com. Subscribe to our mailing list, and we will send you email blasts when new items become available. Um, and, and some of them, many of them are going to be limited edition because we want them to be special. I mean, we're not here to print a 1,000 shirts and, you know, Whatever, you know, we want things to be special. We'll create new merchandise and new things for, for, you know, to to, to make new items. But we want the things that we sell to have some meaning. And part of that meaning is that they're limited. See? See that idea of value being constrained to the limits on things? We appreciate your viewership and listenership today and in the future. Our prayers are with everybody in the Middle East that are affected by this conflict. Our prayers still are with everybody there on the uh, on the border of of Ukraine and Russia who are affected by that war. War is usually wars of the elites, of the kings and the kingmakers, and not of the people. The people are the ones who suffer. The people are the ones who are victimized in whatever variation or combination of corrupt and wicked agendas that are playing out within the political ranks of of higher, higher, uh, uh, you know, government. We appreciate your listenership and your viewership today and in the future. The fight continues. Don't die a jerk off. And as always, Godspeed.